All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going, team? Here, and this is BXGS Weekly, episode fifty-six, bringing you all the best JavaScript news um, of the week in a nice podcast form, or at least I hope it's nice. <laughs> All right, before we get started, I got a couple of announcements to make. So uh, some of you guys were interested to see all the links I collect because uh, in case you don't know, there is a lot more links that I gather over the duration of the week than I actually cover in this podcast because a lot of them um, is just, you know, I think either of low quality or don't really, uh, are not really that relevant or maybe I already covered them, but I get them anyway. So some of you guys were interested to see all of the links that I gather. And um, because I'm using Telegram to essentially gather all of that, I created a new public channel where you can now see all the links. So the link to the channel is now in the description. And the channel is also mirrored to our Discord uh, to BXGS Weekly channel. So if you are curious to seeing those links, make sure to either subscribe to the Telegram channel or join our Discord and you can have a look at all of those links uh, in the real time, essentially. Uh, hey, Abhi, welcome to the stream. But okay, let us get to the news. The first article we got here today is beginner's guide for creating a serverless REST API using Node.js over Google Cloud Functions. And uh, while it says Google Cloud Functions, in reality, it's actually talking about using Firebase. So uh, this is a thing I did not know. So I used the Firebase more than a couple of times but majority of time for its uh, cloud store, which is very convenient when you need to do something like, you know, the email signups or whatever, which is really easy to do and set up. Now, uh, what I didn't know is that uh, you can now actually deploy proper cloud functions using Firebase, which is quite nifty. And this tutorial essentially guides you through how to do that using a pretty basic Express app. Now, there is one thing that uh, feels a bit weird to me, the tutorial actually guides you through building an express app that has multiple endpoints and deploying, uh, deploying that as one function, which uh, feels a bit weird. I mean, typically you wanna have the different endpoints as different functions so that they can actually be spun up separately, right? So this is kind of the idea of um, functional deployment. But anyway, it's a quite nice tutorial. So if you're interested in using uh, Firebase Cloud Functions and Firebase Cloud Store in uh, conjunction with them, this is a pretty good tutorial. So do check it out. Hey, Bagao, welcome to the stream. All right, next article we got here is advanced map shading. This one is really awesome. So the just just behind it is quite simple. We take the map box um, API, we get the map box tile image, and then we get the map box hate map, and we merge that to make a 3D WebGL based visualization of the um, essentially the tile that we fetched, right? It is really awesome. The article is very lengthy. It talks about all the process in details. It talks about how you do that, how you apply the WebGL, how you calculate the height map and, you know, or fetch it and apply it to the tile and so on and so forth. And at the end, you get very nifty 3D visualizations of a specific tiles. Like there's an example of Grand Canyon and uh, San Francisco. It looks amazing. Like this was a joy to read. So if you are interested in WebGL and uh, shading and hate maps and all that kind of stuff, do check it out. It is really cool. Again, it uses Mapbox, so you would have to register and get your own personal key if you want to test it out. But you know, it's a five minute process. And yes, it is really, really cool. Uh, Kevin, welcome to the stream. This is possibly one of my most favorite articles this week. Um, so yes, definitely do check it out. It is absolutely fascinating. Right, next thing we got here is patterns for data fetching and React. Um, simple article talking about different approaches to fetching data in React, starting from you know the components fetching their own data, going to higher order component that distributes data to children and going to the single point that basically fetches the data and distributes it to everything else. So it's, it's more of a conceptual overview rather than anything else. You already know how to handle data fetching in React. You won't find anything new in here, but if you are still struggling with some of the points, then maybe check it out. There's some pretty good thoughts in here. All right, next article we got here is the state reducer pattern with React hooks. Um, I. Don't remember if I actually covered the original uh, state reducer pattern article from uh, Mr. Cansey Dodds here. Um, he used it in downshift, which like the pattern itself is really, really cool, right? So if you never heard about it, make sure to read the original article. 
Now, what the article here talks about is actually using this pattern with hooks and how hooks can simplify um, this approach. Um, yeah, essentially make it quite much easier. The article itself does give quite a contrived example as the author himself notes, but I think the, the pattern itself is really cool. And if you're writing a lot of React, it's definitely worth looking into and learning essentially. So if you never heard about it, make sure to check out again, first the original article to understand what's going on. And then maybe this one, if you're interested in using it with hooks. Right, next article we got here is React Hooks, test custom hooks with Enzyme. So in case you didn't know, uh, Enzyme still doesn't support testing hooks out of the box. So there's some workarounds required for it. I believe it is coming soon, the hook support. But uh, for now, this is essentially a tutorial that shows you how you can test your custom hooks in Enzyme without relying on any additional libraries. I mean, it's it's actually relatively straightforward, but still there's some things to keep in mind. So if you're working with Enzyme and hooks, make sure to check this out. Um, this basically explains everything. If you already know how to test the hooks with Enzyme, then well, you won't really find anything new here. All right, next thing we got here is standardizing WASI, a system interface to run WebAssembly outside of the web. This is another very exciting article from this week. And yes, as the title says, it talks about the new standardization efforts, uh, VASI or WASI. I'm not sure how to correctly pronounce that. I guess I'll just go with VASI because it's simpler. <laughs> so the idea is that um, they are now aiming to standardize the WebAssembly system interface so that you can take WebAssembly out of the web and apply it anywhere. Uh, primarily because people are already doing that, right? So we have um, a bunch of projects that take the WebAssembly and move it out of the web to, for example, Edge, like Cloudflare Workers, or move it to um, separate runtime, like the Vasmer, right? And uh, effort to standardize it is really cool because that means we could have a lot more of those uh, WebAssembly uh, runtime com compliant uh, systems. Currently, the three implementations of VASI already exist, which is impressive. There's the VASM time, which is the Mozilla runtime. There's the Lucet, which is the Fastly WebAssembly runtime. I don't remember if I've included it. I think I included the link to the announcement in the shorter versions of the news, but it is, it is very fascinating. So if you are interested in WebAssembly even a tiny bit, make sure to read the articles. There is a lot of details on why do we need the VASI? How exactly it works? Um, how is WebAssembly running outside of the browser today? And so on and so forth. A lot of explanation, technical sites. It is like, it's, it's really exciting to see that. And um, I'm really curious to see if the WebAssembly will replace uh, JVM in the long run, because it seems like it actually could, because I mean, you know, the portability is pretty much the same and overhead, I, I, I guess it's on par. I would be very curious to see the comparison of, um, WebAssembly virtual machines with a JVM to see how exactly it compares in terms of performance and uh, RAM management, right? Because they're kind of close in what they do. Um, obviously, WebAssembly is not as mature as uh, JVM, but it is fascinating. So it's it's really cool to see where the web system is, web platform is moving, and how is it going to actually spread outside of the web itself, which is kind of hilarious on its own. But yes, so there you go. All right, next article we got here is one reduced to rule them all. This is sort of a comprehensive guide to uh, array.reduce method that explains you everything you need to know about it, how to use it and different use cases where it can be useful with a pretty nice illustrations that sort of explain the things that happen along the way. So if you are Still not sure why would you use reduce, still not sure how it works, then this is a very good guide to get started. If you already know how reduce works, then well, nothing really new over here, but uh, yeah, there you go. All right, next thing we got here is customizing Chart.js in React, or as I would actually say, it's more of a tutorial on using Chart.js and React without relying on third-party libraries. So the um, article starts with, you know, hey, there's actually this React Chart.js 2 wrapper that is really nice and easy to use, but it's not customizable. So you actually just get out of the box solutions and you cannot really tweak anything. So the article then proceeds to explain how to take Chart.js and use it in your React app without actually relying on third-party library, which is actually relatively straightforward. 
Now it doesn't use hooks, so you will be working with the old component did mount and all that kind of stuff. I mean, the tutorial itself is pretty straightforward. It will just guide you through creating a simple chart with chart.js and then manipulating its properties, adding tooltips and stuff like this. So if you are looking or using chart.js in React, make sure to check this one out. Next article we got here, or actually a series of articles, is an introduction to web components. This is a five part series that uh, teaches you, well, basically everything you need to know about web components, starting from the uh, basic elements like custom elements, shadow DOM, HTML templates, and stuff like this, and going to, you know, tutorial essentially on crafting reusable templates, creating custom elements, encapsulating style and structure with shadow DOM and using some advanced tooling for web components. So if you wanted to uh, have a deep dive into web components and didn't know where to start, well, then there you go. Sort of all in one guide here. If you already know everything about web components or at least the basics, then you won't really find anything new here. Next article we got here is how to create animated React components with Kendo UI. I honestly, before that article, I thought Kendo UI was sort of a separate uh, UI library, like, you know, kind of, like a competitor to React if you would, but turns out they have a bunch of other packages that work with React as well. And uh, one of them is Kendo UI React Animations. And apparently you can use it to animate some of the React components. So there you go. And this is exactly what the article talks about using this uh, Kendo React Animations thing to animate your React components. So if you are interested in checking it out, maybe you were looking for an animation library, then do have a look at that. It actually seems quite good. Um, so it seems to be operating on the React, uh, what was it, CSS transition group? Yeah, React transition group uh, under the hood. So it's, it should be quite good. Yes, uh, I thought it was like Ember-like thing, but apparently it's, you know, it's sort of evolving, I guess, into a bunch of different packages. So there you go. But all right, continuing, we got 10 custom React hooks you should have in your toolbox. Um, a bit of a clickbaity title is, you know, this X number of things that you should know about and so on and so forth. But uh, nonetheless, this is a collection of React hooks that are published on uh, NPM uh, that are actually pretty good. Like some of those hooks are uh, something that you've probably already seen on this podcast as you've been listening for it for quite some time, but some of them are actually very interesting. There is stuff like, yes, use form hook state that basically allows you to build form in a pretty neat way, actually. So there's basically use hook to get uh, functions that expand into uh, input properties that automatically bind everything for you and handle the form changes, which actually looks very clean and very awesome. So if you're interested in React hooks, do check it out. There are some really good examples here, uh, some really cool hooks, and maybe you'll pick up something for your app. All right, next thing we got here is React Native at RC three years later. This is uh, another one of the React Native retrospectives. Uh, there's been a time where there's been like 200 of them coming out in two weeks or so. Um, this one is sort of an outlier because they're, they've been doing this uh, basically every half a year or so, I guess. And they have the older ones, six months, one year, two years, and two and a half years after they've worked with React Native. And it's a pretty lengthy write-up. It's very interesting to read. It is mostly non-technical. It's mostly about teams and uh, sort of the benefits that the JavaScript and React Native brings in terms of uh, bridging the teams together and sort of what disadvantages does it have? What, how does the native developers feel themselves when migrating to React Native and so on and so forth. So if you are considering React Native or if you're already working with it, then do check it out. There are some very interesting thoughts and uh, outlooks here. All right, next thing we got here is using Node.js Express to quickly build a GraphQL server. Um, I mean, we had a bunch of those tutorials already. This is yet another one. If you are still wondering how to build a GraphQL uh, server using uh, Express.js, then well, there's your tutorial. Nothing really super complicated here, very straightforward, very simple. You will build a basic uh, GraphQL server with a pretty straightforward schema and yes, Express is a basis for it. So that's basically all I have to say. Next thing we got here is black box testing a Node.js web API. And uh, what it really means is how to end-to-end -end test an Express API using Axios as an HTTP client. So it's a very basic tutorial on uh, 
sort of rolling your own server and then doing end-to-end -end tests by just sending HTTP requests with Axios to your server that is running in the background to make sure that it actually works as expected in end-to-end -end scenarios, right? And uh, that's basically it. So just uh, guys you through setup. Uh, the author also tells why he decided to use Axios instead of using the super test. And yeah, that's the full setup with, uh, you know, the author uses MongoDB in the back end. So there's the Mongo environment setup, Mongo teardown, drivers disconnect, cleanups, and all that basically is related to the testing a full blown app um, in end to end scenario. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Right, next thing we got here is JavaScript inheritance versus composition, uh, part of advanced JavaScript course from Tyler McGuinness. Um, I mean, his stuff is usually very good. And this one is a premiere on JavaScript inheritance versus composition. And you know, if you already understand how inheritance and composition in JavaScript works, then you won't really find anything new here if you are just getting into JavaScript. And if you are still confused as to when you use the inheritance and when you use composition and what kind of advantages, disadvantages those things have, then do check this out. This article is very comprehensive. Next thing we got here is how to avoid the Boolean trap when designing React components. It is talking about the so-called Boolean trap, right? So the idea is that you have a component that can be, for example, a button that can be primary, secondary, or danger. And if you use a property for that, what happens if you do both primary and secondary? So um, that's, you know, how do you deal with that? And there's a bunch of solutions that you can have to sort of evade that problem. So if you're interested, do check this out. Unity engine uses composition. I, I honestly don't know what Unity uses. I haven't worked with it uh, enough to basically comment on that. So, but I, I personally prefer composition over inheritance for about 99% of cases. I mean, there are some legit cases for inheritance, but in most cases, it just brings headaches instead of simplifying things, you know, <laughs> at least that's my take on it. All right. Continuing, we got responsible JavaScript part one, um, an article that talks about, well, using JavaScript responsibly, as you can guess, and uh, talks about the problems that come with building JavaScript apps for the web and distinguishing between, you know, JavaScript application, web application and websites, sort of keeping the size in mind, keeping the accessibility in mind, having server side rendering and all that kind of stuff. So if you care about performance, if you care about accessibility, and if you care about building things in a web way, well, do read it. There are some good points in here. If you don't care about them, do read it anyway, because then maybe you will start caring about it. <laughs> all right. Next thing we got here is what you should know about JavaScript arrays. And this is essentially a comprehensive guide to a JavaScript arrays all the functions uh, with pretty good examples, basically all you have to know about arrays really. Like if you already know how arrays work and if you already know all the functions, including the latest ones like uh, flat map and flats, then well, you won't really find anything new here. If you are just getting into JavaScript, this is a pretty good starting point for arrays. Right, so next thing we got here is the action pattern, clear and obvious testable codes. Uh, so this is, I guess, an an example on how you can rewrite your code using the action pattern, right? The actions that sort of work and how you can convert the existing API endpoint to use action pattern to make it simpler, which is a very good uh, example on how to rewrite code in general, not just specifically using action pattern and uh, a very good write up on the action pattern itself. So if you never heard about it, do check it out. There are some pretty good pointers on how to make your code simpler. Um, adding stuff to the God class gets annoying when it grows too much. Uh, okay, I guess you're, you're referring to Unity, but as I said, I have no idea what the God class is and how it works. So I'm just gonna skip that. <laughs> All right, next thing we got here is disguise driven testing, Jest mocks in depth. It's an article that talks about mocking in Jest, why it is powerful, how to use it and when not to use it, which is, I guess, the most important part. And uh, yeah, essentially, Mocking in Jest is extremely powerful, and if you um, abuse it, you can yeah you can you can basically write tests that won't test what you want them to, but it can be extremely helpful. So if you are not familiar with mocking at all, or you are confused about how it works, then definitely check this article out. It basically guides you through everything you need to know about mocking in Jest. 
Right. That is actually it for the article and news. Now we're coming to the short sized bits and awesome things. The first one we got here today is the new Red Monk programming language ranking uh, from January 2018. And the thing that I wanted to highlight is that the JavaScript is now number one. It is the highest ranked language overall, which is kind of insane. The TypeScript is also gaining uh, crazy popularity as we see here and uh, getting into the top 20, which is very surprising. I mean, I wouldn't call it very surprising, but it is really cool to see that. If you're curious about more details, do check it out. There's also some insights in there. All right, next thing we got here is should I use Preact Compat? A guide to explaining what is Preact Compat package, when do you need to use it, and why should you use it at all? So if you were confused about Preact and Preact Compat, do check it out. Next article we got here is announcing Lucet, Fastly's native WebAssembly compiler and runtime. So this is exactly the um, WebAssembly runtime that we're talking about in the VASI spec announcement. It allows you to uh, run, run WebAssembly out of the browser essentially, and it supports this WebAssembly system interface, the new thing that we just talked about a couple of minutes ago. So if you're curious, it's all open source and available on GitHub. You can quickly uh, clone it and test it and see how it works, which is really awesome. So I am really looking forward to see how that will develop and how WebAssembly will evolve going further, especially with the uh, VASI spec available. Next thing we got here is um, easily identify problems in Node.js application with diagnostic reports. So this is a new feature that's been recently added to uh, Node.js. It's called Diagnostic Report Utility. This quick article outlines how it works and what can you do to get those diagnostic reports and how you can actually use them to um, figure out the problems. It is an experimental feature and this article is essentially also the request for feedback. So if that sounds like the use case you might have, definitely do check it out, try it out and provide the feedback to the um, people in charge essentially. There is a Node.js diagnostic user feedback repo where you can provide your feedback. Bear in mind the diagnostic reports only available uh, starting from Node 11.8 and later and they are still behind the experimental flag so you would have to enable that. Next thing we got here is bending Jest to our will, restoring Node.js require behavior. So if you didn't know, Jest actually hijacks the require and rewrites it to um, basically mock things when required and require them when not. So uh, the article talks about monkey patching the Jest require to restore the original behavior and uh, yeah, essentially not mock things when not needed. Uh, obviously you have to use it, you have to be very careful in using it because it's gonna break the Jazz default behavior. But if you need that, then there you go. There's a pretty small guide to it. Next article we got here is building Spotify's new web player. A pretty interesting um, overview of how the new Spotify web player was built, what kind of technologies were used, how did they decide it on different tech stacks, and stuff like this. So if that sounds interesting, then uh, definitely check it out. There's some pretty interesting thoughts in here about the web platform and about the tech decisions, essentially. Next thing we got here is introducing experimental integrity policies to Node.js. So you remember how we talked about the problem where you npm install something, you cannot actually verify the integrity of the module, right? Well, that's actually getting addressed and we're getting the, well, pretty much the same thing as the web has, we get in the resource integrity in Node.js. So you can actually uh, validate the integrity of installed dependencies using the SHA hashes from the Git, obviously if they are published. Um, again, it's experimental, it's behind the flags and there's like additional steps needed to actually um, run that uh, available starting Node.js 11.8. But it's really cool that it's there and I'm kind of looking forward to getting this basically as a core feature of NPM or Yarn, like whatever, whoever first implements it because, you know, running Yarn install and being sure that all of your dependencies are actually, you know, have integrity and haven't been hijacked sometime in the middle, that would be great. Uh, where uh, where are they with the NPM permissions idea? I honestly don't know. I haven't heard anything about that since the last discussion, but um, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. 
uh, I guess, you know, the permissions thing is way more complex than just verifying integrity, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna see how that develops. I'm guessing there's something happening behind the scene, but yeah, I, I haven't heard anything. I haven't seen any public information yet, at least. All right, continuing, we got the new ESM implementation just landed in Node.js core. It is still behind the flag and there's still work to be done, but it is an amazing accomplishment it is Miles Boring's notes here. So ES modules are closer to getting shipped in the node, um, next node release essentially. I'm not sure when it's gonna happen. And current plan is to land it in 12 and then backport it to uh, staff, but essentially, Miles uh, here is asking whether they should do it in 11x as soon as possible. And most of people, me including, say yes, just give me the modules already. So we might get ES modules enabled by default in the next release of Node.js 11.x, whatever that be, maybe even next week. So we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Uh, right, this is quite exciting anyway. So the next thing we got here is the shortest way to conditional insert properties into an object literal using the spread and conditions, which is uh, really, really neat. So um, this is snippets, right? So you just spread, then you do condition, and then you do ends, and then you just paste the object with a new property. I did something similar, but I usually did it like the question mark, so the ternary uh, condition, question mark, then the property, if, if it's true, then we insert the property value. And if it's false, I just usually put the object there. But turns out you can omit the, this part and just do the uh, ends, um, which seems to be working relatively well. It's a very elegant way of doing it. So rest spread for the win. If that sounds interesting, do check out the article. There's a bit more examples and explanation of how exactly that works. Next thing we got here is introducing the Jetstream 2 benchmark suit, the new version of Jetstream, uh, which is the benchmark from the uh, WebKit team. Uh, this time around, it includes uh, a bunch of additional um, benchmarks, specifically, for example, for WebAssembly and for other non-tested features and areas from the previous version. And uh, you know what blew my mind? So this is from the WebKit team, right? So obviously Safari is gonna perform the best when they just ship the benchmark. But uh, when you look at this chart, you actually see that the Chrome 73 is not that far behind the latest Safari, which is damn impressive considering they just published the benchmark itself. So there you go, another benchmark, another way to test the code, another race to get the better numbers. Quite exciting. All right. Now we are coming to the releases section. We actually only have two releases this time around. The first one is TypeScript 3.4. Um, we already talked about it when the uh, release candidate was released. Essentially the major improvement here is the faster subsequent builds using the incremental flag. And there's a bunch of other uh, language specific features. Again, I'm not the TypeScript user, so I cannot comment uh, too much about it. But if you're interested, do check out the release notes. And the second release we got here today is the Node.js version 11.13 with a bunch of essentially chores and some bug fixes. And you know, it's, it's a minor release so nothing, nothing of note as far as I can tell at least. All right, now we are coming to libraries and demos section. We do have a ton of libraries this time around for some reason, so there you go. So the first thing we got here is fast DOM, lightweight replacement for React Mobex and React Router all in one. The library allows you to create quick and responsive interfaces using only JavaScript or TypeScript. Very small and fast as the author claims. Um, now here's the deal. Uh, it compares itself with um, Preact, Vue, Angular and React, but there is a bunch of other libraries that are sort of uh, compete with the Preact, React, whatever, in terms of speed, like Inferno.js, for example. And they actually claim to be a lot faster than Preact, Vue, React, or anything else. It's kind of interesting to see why, uh, how this would compare against them and why author doesn't actually compare it himself to those libraries. But nonetheless, you know, if you're looking for a very fast library for some reason, then check it out. Uh, beware, this is zero, uh, it is still 0029 alpha, so probably not production ready. All right, next thing we got here is ESLint plugin proper ternary. This is an ESLint rule to ensure proper usage of ternary conditional op, uh, expressions. 
and uh, it is from the Getify. Um, the idea is that the default rule that well majority of ESLint people use is that you cannot nest ternaries, right? And in some cases you actually want to nest them and in some cases it's quite readable. So this is a bit more complex rule that allows you nesting in specific cases. Like you can nest when your nested option is nested in, for example, if, right, or in else, or like this. There is a ton of customization and you can tweak it yourself and it actually looks very comprehensive. I still, I don't know, like majority of time I don't nest them because it, I just feel like it gets very hard to read. But in some cases, like this third example here, it actually is quite easy to read and this is the way that I would, I guess I would allow in some cases. So, if you're working a lot with tenary expression, do check it out. It seems to be worth adding to your um, ESLint config. All right, next thing we got here is CVS, a modified version of UWeb sockets with some minor tweaks in C++ code and complete rewrite of a JavaScript code. Since uh, UWeb web sockets were uh, deprecated or I don't know, destroyed, removed. I'm not even sure what even happened to that. At some point it just disappeared somewhere. Well, someone forked the last existing version essentially and uh, started updating it again and rewritten the whole uh, JavaScript bits into the TypeScript, if I remember correctly, yes. And uh, yeah, it's now available as CVS. So if you are looking for a WebSocket library that is essentially UVS, but maintains, then I guess there it is. All right, next thing we got here is Majestic, a zero config GUI for Jest that actually looks really, really cool. So if you're looking for a UI for Jest that will allow you to watch things, run tests and uh, see the coverage and failing tests and so on and so forth, all in a nice UI, then this actually looks pretty slick. So do check it out. Next thing we got here is trading Vue.js uh, on this specific hackable charting library for trace, uh, sorry, for traders. <laughs> you can draw literally anything on top of candlestick charts. So it seems like it's, it's specifically candlestick charts with the ability to draw anything on top of them and it's specifically made for traders, which <laughs> maybe you need that. So if, if that sounds like something you would use, do check it out, but this seems to be very, very specific library for very, very specific use case. But anyway, that thing exists. Next thing we got here is Saltine, a snappy and lightweight utility to encrypt and decrypt values with salt. Very straightforward, very simple, yes, and just a few hundred bytes uh, from Luke Edwards, as usual, he's delivering on super tiny, super efficient libraries. If you ever need to encrypt or decrypt something with salt, then do check this one out, uh, just 259 bytes. Next thing we got here is Mosaic, a front-end JavaScript library for building user interfaces. Um, it, it like honestly, after looking at the examples they have here, it feels like this is, um, I guess, an evolution of. I'm not even sure. At first, I thought it was like a. Oh, no, wait, wait, was it this one? It was a library today that looked like Backbone a lot, but this actually is not it. This more looks like a view with um, using template literals for templating instead of building your own language. Essentially, this is actually yeah right. This is I'm confusing things. So this one is actually. Very close to view and um, I mean, it seems quite nice actually. So if you are looking for a new library and for some reason is not happy with view or React and do check it out. It doesn't require any compilation step or anything like this because it uses template literals for uh, things, which could be quite nice. All right, uh, next thing we got here is React Particles WebGL, a 2D, 3D particle library built on React, 3JS and WebGL that has absolutely awesome demo. There we go, there's the demo and uh, it has a ton of different things that you can uh, visualize, including Snowfall that is, I mean, it's, it's 3D, right? So, and uh, yes, the uh, stupid thing is that you can, for example, do bouncing snow. So it, it actually will bounce from the ground and uh, just bounce around and fly around, which is <laughs> ridiculous. I'm not sure why would you use it on your website, but if you ever needed a um, particle library that allows you to do silly things like this for, for some reason, then there you go. That, that actually seems to be quite nice. And you can uh, generate config here and then just export it as, as JSON and then load it into your uh, app and just have that visualized. All right, next thing we got here is structure.js, a simple schema, uh, 
Let me try that again. A simple schema attributes library built on top of modern JavaScript. So yeah, it's it's a schema library that for some reason wraps classes and adds properties to classes that are sort of provided by that library, which looks weird, like a bit weird to me. Uh, because like I always, you know, it's like you write the class and then you wrap it into attributes and it might, it feels like it might overwrite the existing properties, right? So it doesn't seem like there's any safeguards against that in the code, at least I, I've looked at it. Um, but maybe that looks fine for you. I guess this was supposed to be a decorator because this is how you use them. But uh, because we don't have decorators, it's, yeah. I mean, I maybe you know why, why you need that and how to use that, so do check it out. Uh, would you show that cool JSON URL linked on Discord? Can you share the link in the chat right now? And after I finish with the demos, we can go to that. Right, uh, so the next thing we got here is EOLO Kale, internationalization React uh, for React, uh, just two kilobytes with Intel API and everything. Um, does seem like it has any special tools for gathering that or anything like that, but does seem like you can internationalize, yeah, I hate that word, internationalize your app quite easily. So do check it out. Next thing we got here is React hook form. Uh, performance, flexible and extensible forms with easy to use validation. Um, yeah, seems to be pretty straightforward, pretty easy to use and has errors and data and everything and uses hooks, so quite modern. I, I mean, I guess it's okay. I, I don't know if I would use a separate library like this for, maybe I would, but anyway. <laughs> You're working with forms a lot and uh, looking for form validation using hooks, do check it out. Next thing we got here is formal elegant form management primitives for React hooks era. Now this one looks way, way cooler. Um, so it's similar to one of the hooks that we talked about in the news section. It actually allows you to uh, sort of get the field properties using the hook so that you don't have to specify any handlers or anything like this. And it actually handles them for you, which is the approach that I really like. So that looks interesting, do check it out. It is available for web and for React Native as well. And uh, Ken C. Dawes is one of the contributors, so it's ought to be really good. Next thing we got here is read time estimates, a more accurate medium-like read time estimates that works for a bunch of languages apparently. So if you wanted to add something like this to your website, do check it out. Next thing we got here is React Formalized, a collection of pre-styled JSX element based on HTML form elements, offers an easy way to collect data, uh, form data and or input values. Um, I'm not sure if I, like I, I almost never use pre-styled components uh, because that typically li limits you in a way that you can uh, customize them later on. But in some cases you might want this and this seems to provide a pretty nice a bunch of components that are pre-styled and um, essentially work out of the box, right? So if you, are, if you ever need something like this, do check it out. Next thing we got here is by proxy. A different way of thinking of web client RPC uh, or in reality, an RPC framework based on Express.js for Node.js, right? So you just can create something um, like a calculator in this case, and then you can serve it by using um, by proxy serve thing. And then you can consume it by using by proxy link, but for some reason you consume it by using the file, which just feels a bit weird, but I guess there are some cases when you want that. So if that looks interesting, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Mongoku, web scale GUI for MongoDB, whatever the web scale means in this case. It's, yeah, it's a web UI for MongoDB. It, it looks kind of slick, looks nice. It shows you the documents in string format and in simple JSON, you can edit them in place and everything. Looks okay, I guess. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Apex Charts JS, modern interactive open source charts. Um, this is, I guess, alternative to Chart JS. Looks very slick. Have Vue and React components out of the box, uh, like the official ones. So yeah, it it actually is very good. So if you are interested, do check it out. If you're working with charts, maybe this is what you were looking for. 
Yes, next thing we got here is React 95, probably one of my favorite ones uh, this time around. It's a UI library, um, a components library for uh, React with Windows 95 styling. It is, <laughs> it is literally Windows 95 components for your React app. I like, <laughs> I don't know why, but this makes me very happy. <laughs> so there you go. All right, next thing we got here is, mm, mm, let me try to read that. Not, not, weef, not UI, I'm not sure how to read that, but it's a feature reach front end framework in 10 plus 10 kilobytes. So I guess 20 kilobytes then. Um, yeah, it's, it's a UI framework with a bunch of components and, and model windows and buttons and typography and, and everything you can imagine. And I, I guess it's okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. UI framework, another one. Uh, next thing we got here is Media Player Element, a web component for creating tiny, responsive, international, accessible, easily customizable media players. Basically, all of that is a web component that is quite easy to use and uh, most importantly, accessible. So there you go. If you wanted a web component like this, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Plume, zero dependency JavaScript framework for creative devs. Again, whatever that means. And I think this was the one that looked like Backbone. Uh, yes, exactly. So this framework, like looking at the code samples, it reminds me of Backbone so much um, that I don't know. It's just, it just looks like Backbone. I'm sorry, I just can. But yeah, if you were looking for a JS on the framework uh, for UI, then do check it out, it seems okay i guess it also seems to contain a lot of things that are not specifically ui like audio manager mathematic library web socket supports um web worker manager accelerometer support for some reason it's like I, I, this thing is crazy just i mean check it out if, if that sounds interesting <laughs> all right next thing we got here is plumier or plumier i'm not sure how exactly to read that correctly a delightful Node.js REST API framework powered by Koa and TypeScript. Uh, seems to be a quite nice framework for uh, TypeScript based on Koa, essentially. Very object-oriented, so uh, prepare to write a lot of classes with decorators and stuff like this. If this is your gem, then do check it out for sure. If not, then, well, sorry, there's no way to write this in a functional way. Uh, I mean, that's, you know, I... As you might know, I prefer functional uh, frameworks, so this is definitely not for me, but maybe you like it, so have a look. Next thing we got here is Node.cg, uh, create broadcast graphics using Node.js and a browser. I think it took me about 10 minutes to figure out what the hell does broadcast graphics means. What it actually means is create uh, browser-based uh, graphics for broadcasts, meaning Twitch, YouTube, or whatever, the streaming broadcasts, right? In a very simple way. Uh, now, the tool itself is actually really cool. It allows you to um, create different panels, graphics, SVGs, whatever the hell you want, and then use them as the widgets for Streamlabs, for example, to embed into your streams, which is actually uh, incredibly useful. So if you are doing any sorts of streaming or video recording or whatever and want to overlay stuff over your uh, OBS, then do check it out. This seems to be a very nice way of doing that. Next thing we got here is KubeJS, open source analytics framework. Uh, just as it says, it's a analytics framework that combines uh, quite a bunch of things, including schema, query orchestration, caching, and API gateway, and as well, visualization all in one thing. So if you are working with DataViz and was looking for something that basically can do everything for you in one nice library, then do check this out. Maybe this is what you wanted. Next thing we got here is preview, as in pre and then view as Vue.js. Uh, All-in-one prototyping tool for Vue developers. Uh, this is an Express, uh, sorry, Electron app that allows you to visually build things using Vue components, which actually looks pretty slick. So yeah, if you're working with Vue and you wanted some sort of a visual building tool, I guess, do check it out. This looks pretty good. Next thing we got here is LibreFox, uh, Firefox with privacy enhancements. I do not like the name because, I mean, Firefox is Libre enough as it is, but this is actually a more privacy strict version of Firefox, essentially, with uh, quite a bunch of changes. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. 
The last thing we got here today is uh, the JS 1K competition that is going on right now, I believe. And uh, there is already a ton of one kilobyte demos that will blow your mind. Like if you are curious to see what can be done in just one kilobyte of JavaScript, then just go ahead and um, yeah, look at the demos here. They are freaking insane. Like the things that people can do. Though. Yes, I, I also absolutely love any of the X kilobyte competitions because every, like there, look at this. There is Heroes of Might and Magic in one kilobyte in browser in, in yeah, it's, it, it, it works. Like you can, you can do things. You can go and fight monsters. It, it actually works. Like this stuff is in, it's one kilobyte. And yeah, this is not even the like most impressive demo here, but <laughs> just check it out. There's some really cool stuff. All right, uh, now let's have a look at your JSON visualization tool from Bucko. Paste your JSON here. I don't have any JSON. Uh, random JSON generator. I, I remember there was some JSON generator tool. Yeah, there we go. That's yes. Uh, no, what? No. Yes, try it now. That's fine. Generate. Just give me some JSON. There we go. Let me paste it over here. Uh, I guess, no, my JavaScript is not blocked. So render. Ah, there we go. Okay, it renders JSON to tables. I don't know if that's the way that I would love to read my JSON, but uh, I mean, I guess it looks fine. I typically prefer actually the, um, the way that the... Uh, dev tools do rendering. So if we go to the dev tools and uh, whoops, we say clear and we say const data equal our JSON. So if you actually go here, right? So I actually prefer this way because then I can navigate all the fields. And I don't know, for me, it just feels more, I guess more familiar <laughs> is what I want to say. <laughs> but this is not bad. This is not bad. But okay, um, last thing I want to highlight today is uh, this article that I talked about it actually last time. So um, it started as a joke and a bunch of developers, game developers, trained um, robots to generate garbage slot machine games uh, that were published to um, Android Web Store, uh, sorry, Android Store, right? Uh, Play Store is what I want to say. And um, even though the games were absolute garbage, it was slot machines all over again. They were reskin slot machines with different names, different things in them and so on and so forth. They actually managed to earn $50,000 on the garbage games just because these games existed. And for some reason, some of those games were downloaded more than others. And yeah, this just blows my mind how bad you could be, but still earn a lot of money. Like. What is this? But okay, that is, yeah, that's basically it from my side. Uh, that is all I wanted to cover here today. If you guys have any questions or suggestions, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. Uh, if not, then as usual, if you miss the podcast, it's going to be available as VOD right after the stream on uh, Twitch, or it's going to be available on YouTube uh, once I re-upload it there in an hour or two. Um, as usual, all the links can be found on GitHub or on bxjs.dev website. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. Uh, hi, nice Strief. I'm a Java developer starting to look into JavaScript and Node.js. Wondering if you have any tips on how best to make the transition. Um, I mean, I do write Java from time to time, but um, I, don't, I don't know about your transition. Like it's, it's, I guess I would say if you are very familiar with Java, I would recommend looking into TypeScript because it's very close mentality wise to how the, you know, the Java and C sharp world works, for example. So maybe start with TypeScript, that would probably make it easier for you to write JavaScript in general, because there's, you know, the types and everything and classes and proper um, object oriented programming and private methods and all that kind of stuff. Other than that, I guess just build a couple, try to take your existing Java projects and build them in Node.js and see how that works. <laughs> that would be my best uh, advice, I guess. Okay, um, right. If you have any other questions or suggestions, throw them into the chat right now. If not, then yes, that's basically it. Um, as a reminder, we have a Discord server where you can join and uh, ask us questions about JavaScript. I'm all the time there. I can help you if you have any problems. 
Uh, by the way, it's Davy Jones. Feel free to join our Discord server. I will be more than happy to help you if you have any problems along the way transitioning into JavaScript and Node.js. Um, yes, we now have, as I said in the beginning, Telegram channel for all the links I gather over the week. There is a lot of trashy links there, so uh, bear that in mind. But if you're curious to see how much stuff I look through to get this podcast done, you can follow that. Um, that's basically it from my side. So it seems like no more questions or no more suggestions. Thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you have awesome rest of the weekend or rest of the week if you're watching this later on. Um, yeah, thank you for watching. Thank you for your continued support and I see you next time. Bye.